If you're ever at a dinner party and Wade Davis shows up, my advice is just keep quiet and listen. It's like this warm rain that's come pouring down all over you. Listen to the stories. This is a guy who got high from smoking a psychedelic toad who actually met what appeared to be a zombie who personally retraced the early and deadly assaults on Everest. He's a Canadian anthropologist and author, personal hero. He holds the title of what might be the coolest job ever, explorer in residence at National Geographic. His trailblazing investigation into supposed zombies in Haiti produced a monster bestseller and a film directed by none other than Wes Craven. Christoph, I need you to remember what happened before you died. Wade believes in seeing the world close, and I mean like up close. And he says that if you have a personal relationship with it, well, you'll be kinder to it, you know, kinder to the habitats and the species and the indigenous people. That's why he's helped launch what's called the Lindblad Expeditions, trips that will take eager adventurers to the Arctic Ocean and up and down both Canadian coasts. So great to see you. <laughs> How are things? Great. 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 Welcome back. Yeah, my pleasure. Last time you were here, we were talking about the, the Sacred Headwaters. Yeah, right? and we had a big victory. That's right. It was great. I mean, just update people on what's going on. Well, the Sacred Headwaters is this incredible part of British Columbia where it's really um, the point of origin of our three great salmon rivers, the Stikine, the Skeen, and the Nass. And it's really revered land for all the First Nations. And uh, Shell had a concession there, a tenure to extract coal bed methane over an area of land a million acres. And to their credit, they realized it was a wrong thing to do. And just before Christmas, in, uh, with the support of the Canadian government and the Taltan Central Council, they pulled out. You I was know? thinking about you, you know, when the Idle No More thing popped up, because you've had this, as, an, as a professional explorer, you've had this truly unique opportunity to connect to indigenous peoples around the world. And so you have an outsider's perspective, but an outsider who's had some insider relationships. What did you make of this version? Like, what ha what's happening with Idle No More? Well, you know, what I, one of the things I've found is that, you know, indigenous people aren't sentimental, but they have a kind of mystique of the earth, it's sort of based on the idea that they have sort of responsibilities for the earth, you know? And, uh, you know, in our culture, it's sort of, it's, it's somewhat different. You know, I, I was raised to believe that the mountain was a pile of rock ready to be mined. Well, that may be different than my godchildren in the Andes of Peru who are raised to believe that those mountains are deities that will direct their destiny. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the great stories from history is the Aboriginal people of Australia. The British first arrived they, there, they saw people who looked weird, who, who had a primitive technology as they viewed it, and what really offended the British is that they had no interest in proving upon their lot. And so in the inimitable way of the British, they concluded the Aboriginal people weren't people at all, and they began to shoot them. Right. And what they failed oh, to very British. Yeah, and what they failed to understand is that, is that the, 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 what offended them is that they had no sense of progress. But of course, they failed to understand that in the Aboriginal universe, they had no interest in improving upon anything. The entire ethos was not to change the world, but on, by contrast, to do the ritual gestures necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. Because maybe the world's okay. Maybe the world's okay. And, and the interesting thing is not to, again, say who's right and who's wrong. Had all of us followed that devotional trajectory, yes, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon, but we wouldn't also be talking about climate change and our capacity to really affect the life support systems of the planet. Do but you think there's a capacity to bridge those gaps? To, 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 it seems like what you're talking about is but what they, in that instance, the British, and me, we generally as a culture might lack is an institutionalized version of empathy. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's always good in culture is to sort of find the origin of ideas or notions. I mean, we, you know, our, our, our way of thinking of the Earth is sort of being um, inanimate came from somewhere. You know, when Descartes said all that existed was mind and material, we deanimated the Earth, and, and all ideas of myth and magic and mysticism were sort of swept away. Um, and, and that really began a process whereby science had made a house cleaning of belief, and we could actually do what we do to the Earth because we don't think it as being alive, whereas most of the tribal societies I've lived with have quite the opposite point of view. I mean, all of this said, I think we have to have a great sense of humor. I mean, to, to be a human being and alive, you've got to have a great sense of humor. And I like to sort of balance all this work I do in sort of, you know, environmental protection or the celebration of the wonder of culture with some of the kind of weirder things I've gotten to do, you know, under my belt, like you, what, zombies and toads yeah, and can all I, that. Speaking of zombies, can we play, the, watch this clip here. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Don't let them bury me. I'm not 
I'm dead. Yeah, that. Okay, that's a serpent in the rainbow. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's my good friend Bill Pullman playing me. It's that, you. That did not happen. So you were never zombified? No, but I mean, the funny thing is that things that did happen were even... Crushing me, Wade. Uh, I was never a victim of the poison at all, but I mean, things that did happen in Haiti that I didn't put into the book were pretty extraordinary, you know? So you've seen the zombification there? I've, I've, I've collected the poison. I, um, I met a zombie. I documented his past. And the theory I had was that zombification was a form of punishment. And um, the poisons um, brought on a state of apparent death so profound that it could fool a physician. Right. One of the ingredients was this big toad called Bufo marinus, the, the Caribbean toad, are veritable chemical factories. And in the 1960s, when anthropologists were finding hallucinogens everywhere, some Mayan archaeologists suggested that this toad could be hallucinogenic, mm -hmm. simply because in those glands it had one compound, bufotenine, which was found in the vegetable snuffs in the Amazon that are hallucinogenic. But all these kids got onto this literature and started licking the toads and practically dying. And when in doubt, who do you call? So I got so sick of being woken up in Vancouver by you know, medical emergencies back here in Toronto that I finally looked into this. And I flew down to Tucson the next weekend. And we had this informant called White Dog. He was a white Rastafarian from Minneapolis. Name White Dog? Was Dog, dog. spelled D-O-G or D-A-W-G? D-A-W-G. D-A-W-G. Awesome. And he takes us out to the Sonoran Desert and turns us on to this other species of bufo, bufo alvarius, and shows us how you can milk the toad and smoke it. So we tried this on ourselves, proved that it was hallucinogenic, and, um, and then wrote up these papers. And we thought, we were thought we were going to be on the cover of Nature or Science. We got on the cover of the Wall Street Journal and practically got arrested for, for starting a new drug cult. We were not trying to start a new drug cult. We were trying to get kids not to lick toes. Tell you first of all, because, I, because I'm, I'm generally curious, about this, what was the high like? It was, you know, a pleasant, um, a pl a pl a, definitely a pleasant ride. <laughs> You know, if you get a PhD, you get to do these things, you know? <laughs> it's a real pleasure to see you. Yeah, man. Oh, it's always great. Thank so Thanks so much, George. Anytime. Ray okay. Davis, everybody. By the way, it's davisway.com. We'll be right back.